So for mechanical ventilation, this would be for the exhaust flow. Uh, anyone here familiar with the ASHRAE 62.2 standard? Okay. So that's got to deal with providing, as, air, as homes get more airtight, you need to bring in fresh air. And some of the strategies, the simpler strategies, involved exhaust only, mechanical ventilation. But you're trying to achieve a certain ventilation number, so you've got to measure that CFM airflow. So this standard talks about the volumetric airflow, or the CFM, cubic feet per minute, moving through the system. And this is actually an illustration from the standard. It talks about three places where you can measure. Now, being educators here, what's the assumption being made if all these three are considered equal? What's, if, if you're saying the inlet, CFM is equal to the one you measure in the duct, is equal to the one you can measure at the outlet. outlet. If all those three are equal, what's being assumed? Uh, not, no friction, no leakage. So no leakage between any of these points. So again, you, sometimes you have to be a little bit of an investigator to understand and, and know if there's any duct leakage between these points, you may not be, have equivalent measurements all the way along. So at the air inlet terminal, and this is by the book in that standard where it's talking about airflow measurement techniques, they recommend a powered flow hood, but right now it boils down to just one flow hood available that's a powered flow hood. Again, because it is a superior measurement. In a lot of cases, this is also trying to explain the, um, the impact of different costs for test and measurement equipment because they either they do more for you or provide a better answer. So you, you need to understand at what level you need to be in price because you're going to get a certain performance from it. And we'll talk about some of these other factors that have low cost tools to make the measurement, but to get a good measurement, you need to have a lot of human interaction. You have to know what you're doing, follow a good process, be consistent, that kind of thing. So it's either get the consistency or get the speed of measurement and you pay for it because the machine is being more consistent than you are. So there's a little bit of automation going on here. The airflow resistance device is this exhaust fan flow meter, and we'll show an illustration of that in a moment. But there's limitations on it. You can only use it if there's one branch because there's interaction. Again, system effect. When you put this device on, it could affect the airflow out another part of the system. And then only when the box pressure, and you'll see it, I should have taken it out of my bag, but it's, it's in there somewhere. Um, if the box pressure has to be within a certain small range of pressure, and it gets beyond that range of pressure, and it's starting to interact with the system, and it's no longer a good measurement. It starts to be a fuzzy measurement, because air is compressible, air is squishy. Passive flow hoods can also be used for this type of measurement. And when the tolerance is between plus or minus 5% or plus or minus 5 CFM, but there's another caveat, another standard overlaid in there, only when the hood pressure is less than 8 pascals. So again, a very small pressure inside that hood. Otherwise, it's going to start to affect the measurement. Now, these standards are put up there. And I'll show you a couple things coming up in a moment where you might scratch your head and say, is this really in a national standard? Well, this is the first one created for this industry, for the home energy rating system industry. Uh, and standards are put out there to be commented on, to be fed back on. So if you ever get the opportunity, you see a standards notice coming out, call for comments, that kind of thing, revisions. I've been on standards committees, and actually every single revision, every single comment is looked at, is viewed, is responded to. They correspond. It's a very... Uh, very diligent process by the people that create the standards. So don't feel like your voice can't be heard. It, it can be heard. Going again, we're talking about in, inlet, outlet measurement, and then midstream measurement for this exhaust standard. At the outlet terminal, these powered flow hoods are also allowed. 
but we've already seen a little bit of interaction. You're all here familiar with uh, ECM motors, sort of like smart motors. They, they react to the load in the system. Well, the smart fan and the smart motor working together actually interact with each other. Has anyone seen that YouTube video of Alexa and Google Home talking to each other? Yeah, go look it up. If it's, it's a pretty, pretty funny if you get a chance to see that. But two automated systems actually start to talk back and forth to each other. And again, because the assumptions aren't known, these two systems, the fan and the powered flow hood, never reach a balance point. So that's been identified to the manufacturer that they should be looking into that to see if they can come up for some kind of resolution. A bag inflation device is actually called out in this national standard. And I'm going to go through with sort of the diligence and effort that they came up with to talk about a bag inflation device. It has to have an airtight perimeter seal, a plastic bag of a known volume. How would you determine the volume of a plastic bag? Well, it's kind of squishy. It's, you know, it's flexible. That, that becomes really heavy to do, very difficult. Actually, someone had a really good idea. Fill it up with foam peanuts and then dump it into a cardboard box and then measure the volume of the box. If the stacking's about the same, it's going to be about the same amount of volume. Okay? So there, there's a way of doing that. A frame to hold the bag open, a shutter to control the airflow into the bag. This starts to sound like product design here. <laughs> um, the thickness of the bag shall be selected that the measurements are consistent within 20% of each other. But in order to do that, you would need to know what the measurements actually should be to know if they're consistent. So you would need some other kind of device. And then the volume of the bag must be chosen so, so that it fills within 3 to 20 seconds. Um, so there's a lot of specifications on this. And this is a recipe for making your own bag inflation device because no one builds one. There's no manufacturer out there. So there's some kind of consistency issue, I would say, with this part of the standard. So I'm just going to do one element of this, the bag math. For 100 CFM airflow, if you kind of backwards calculate, it works out to a 38-gallon bag, which seems reasonable. You know, contractor bags are in that kind of 40, 35 to 42-gallon range. But they're also pretty heavy and pretty thick. And that's going to have an impact on the system. That's going to affect its consistency. And for a 20-second inflation, it's a 500-gallon bag. And I challenge you to fill that one with water and measure it. <laughs> or even find the bag to do that. So I think the point here, though, is that you want to have a reasonable amount of time to run the stopwatch, which I didn't mention. You also need a stopwatch to do the back inflation device method. So this, this is sort of a, uh, maybe a part of the standard which should be picked at a little bit. Someone actually developed one of these. There's a couple of YouTube videos that are out there on someone that's created a bag inflation device. You can see the foam seal. There's a trigger, actually. There's a hinge for the door. Uh, there's a lightweight bag that's sealed to the perimeter and edge of that. And because it's used at the outlet side, there can be things like you know, brick surfaces, siding, other factors that you need to have to make a good seal. I actually. Um, Friday, I was doing some testing with uh, different types of airflow measurements, sort of wrap my head around what I'd be talking about this week. And I was using one measurement, getting consistent results from it. And then I happened to take, and there was a very small hole at the edge of it. And I was running airflows of around 110 CFM through a, a bathroom exhaust fan that's mounted in a box. And I was a very small edge kind of around the corner where it wasn't sealing up. I took some painter's tape and sealed the edge, and it changed it by 15%. So there's, air does weird things. And I think there's somebody here who's done a lot of experimenting with air from a, a calculational standpoint and what to, to verify air does weird things. So some of the challenges, and I'm working with a guy who teaches this method, uh, and I'm not going to read you through all these, but there's consistency issues. Um, Different ways probes are being used, and we'll talk about those in a minute. And then the allowable tolerances, if you pick through the standard, it allows for a very broad range of tolerances, but all these are be being considered equivalent. So it sort of begs the question, why does one have to be plus or minus 5%, another one can be 20, and still be acceptable measurements in the standard? So again, these are the points I'm going to bring up for, for my picking on the standard. 
but since the standard's created, it can now be picked on and improved. So I found, uh, I think it was just last week, I found a K or excuse me, a white paper on K factors. Anyone familiar with K factors? Heard of K factors? And I've always sort of had a, a mild confusion with them, but this white paper really drove it home. And I'll share you the link of the company that came up with this. And I'm not going to read you all this, but these are sort of the summary points of here, just the ones highlighted in red. They're really no longer being presented for grills, actual K factors for grills. Uh, they're not based on any physical dimensions or area on the grill. So K factors of grills and AK or area or open area are two very different things that, that do not relate. So the point here is don't confuse the two. If you see a K factor on a grill, it's probably an older design grill or maybe some older curriculum you're teaching off of. Uh, be aware that you're looking for open area when you're doing a lot of these tests. Dependent on the type of device, specified on some old devices from Elnor with different types of flow. Even the two devices that were used, they were industry standard at that time, yielded different results when applied in the same manner. So there was an inconsistency there. And then no, none of the two devices, neither of the two devices are presently being used. So there's uh, you know, this, this, the standard K factor you might be familiar with, the grill K factor. Please be careful when using it. Kruger HVAC, Kruger-HVAC.com. Those are the folks that wrote this white paper. Uh, I think I just Googled uh, K factor, grill K factor, airflow. And boom, this white paper came up. So it's very easily found if you want to read through all the detail and better understand that. Um, they do talk about newer electronic measuring devices, which is what pretty much what I'm presenting here. They do depend upon the measurement location, the tip geometry, sensitivity to temperature, and there's no industry standard arrangement. However, this ResNet standard is starting to develop that industry standard arrangement. So I, I think we're sort of moving from you know, one age of airflow measurement to another age of airflow measurement, uh, where things hopefully will become more consistent. This is a very important point on supplies. The jet of air leaving a diffuser or grill can be very highly variable. Have, have you ever experienced that? And if you want to demonstrate that, you should get these inexpensive smoke puffers and I know a guy who sells them. But you can get these smoke puffers and demonstrate it to students and let them see the airflow coming out of a grill so they understand what's actually happening. And the, the grills, the diffusers are defined to spread air and to create a diffusion pattern, as we know, to, to make the room comfortable, to do the job of conditioning the space. But it makes the job of measurement very difficult. So while you can determine AK for one type of anemometer, it wouldn't work for all types. And then a better or more common measurement is use a flow hood to, de to determine airflow in and out of outlets. So this capture hood, again, is being recommended. This bulk measurement is being recommended when you want to try to take these kind of measurements on supplies and returns like you see here. Again, just finishing up here, the most accurate is a pitot traverse in a straight run of duct. Um, and it's usually got to be hard duct because a lot of systems are installed with flex duct in residential. And that makes things quite a bit more difficult to take a, a stable measurement with. And then the, the big summary statement here, and I'm just going to make sure we emphasize that, AK factor cannot be used to determine the actual free area of an outlet or inlet. If it says open area, that's OK to use that calculation, that number. But AK is something that goes back to a device that's no longer being made. And then the interesting thing, the best way to compare the free area is to compare pressure or sound levels. That's very interesting. But again, that sort of sounds like a homebrew experiment uh, to be able to, to develop that. I think they're speaking more towards the manufacturers or perhaps an architectural engineering company to do that. OK, so now what? Um, engineers figured it out, so go figure. You're making the world more complicated um, and their effort to try to make the world better. Um, the correction factor is a multiplier, and you, you'll see it in a lot of different places. And I'm just going to kind of move through here. Supply grills, it's okay to use the free area or open area factor if it's talked about. 
but the AK factor is not okay to use. It's not a substitute for the open area. It's something that was related to an old technique. Pitot tubes are okay for airflow measurement, or excuse me, pitot tubes have K factors. That's something important to know. Um, one of the devices I'm passing around, the, the displayless manometer, the Testo 510i, when you go into its app, you can actually set the K factor for the pitot tube in it. So if you use, most of the pitot tubes you'll, you'll purchase are likely a K factor of one, and that's the way most of the programs are set to run. But if it's different, you gotta know the difference and you gotta put it in there, otherwise you could end up with a very different value. Airflow probes have K factors. I'll pass around some airflow probes and we'll talk about them in a minute in a little bit more detail. Uh, flow hoods actually have K factors. So you, you need to know if the flow hood has a K factor. Sometimes the manometer coupling to the flow hood will have a K factor adjustment because you can use different geometries of flow hoods, which may affect the way it reads out from the pressure array. So different skirts, if you will, sizes to adapt to the supplies and the returns. And other devices like VAV boxes may have K factors. And all these K factors are not equivalent. That's really the point of what I'm trying to say here. You should use it, but understand why you're using it first. Okay, so, so question, if you're, if you're not grounded and certain in that, question where that comes from. And a lot of times going back to the manufacturer, whatever device you're using, either their instruction manuals, their spec sheets, or a phone call can support that and help you get that information. So when you look at open area, now let's move to the open area aspect. You can actually, uh, if that is, that is specified on the, the spec sheet for the grill, um, looking at one manufacturer's list, you might see that the open area has a range. If you go down through this chart and say, well, I think I could pick one number here, and I might pick 70. That's gonna get me close enough. It's within about five, seven percent. But then when you go to a, another type of register, if you're not aware of that, it drops down to the 50% range for the open area factor. And then you might say, well, the larger the grill dimension, the smaller the open area, except when you work down through the chart and you'll find that it does, it does go the opposite direction. So the bottom line in here is it's, it's like a fingerprint. You need to know it for the type of grill you're using. And the darn thing is that most of the time in the residential industry, they aren't specified. They're, they're impossible to come up with. Someone suggested I show this illustration, I forgot, maybe somebody in the room here uh, suggested I show this illustration to illustrate about the positioning of the probe being very critical in terms of going through a diffuser, e either from a return side or a supply side. So if, if we're measuring on the return side of a diffuser, if you're oriented in this area, your velocity may be very low. If you orient closer to the center stream, the velocity will be higher. If you move back out of this flow field, the velocity starts to drop off quite a bit. So there's a sweet spot of measurement within about three quarters to an inch and a half in front of a, a, a return where you're, and that's, that also depends on the, the velocity or flow to the return, where you're gonna get a reasonably stable, repeatable measurement. However, if you use something like a capture hood, you don't have to worry about it or any kind of capture device that seals and takes all the measurements. But if you're doing a traverse and you're moving your probe around, your pitot tube, your hot wire around, if you're moving them around, or even your rotating vane moving around here, where you hit it will make a huge difference. On the supply side, you're gonna get the same kind of thing, a jet of air moving out. If you hit, if you take a measurement off here, you're gonna get a low reading, measuring the center, a high reading, measuring over here in a low reading. Again, you should try this out. If you have these tools available in your lab, move a pitot around in front of a supply or return. See how that variation goes. Uh, it, it's all part of teaching technique, again, um, when you're doing these type of measurements. 